thank you so much for making the time to join the second meeting of the Patients and Communities Committee. So we're still young, but we're progressing into our toddler hood now, gently. Um, now, some housekeeping. Um, so the meeting is held in public. So that's not a public meeting, it's held in public. Uh, the meeting is being recorded uh, and the recording is going to be used for uh, transcribing the minutes from this meeting as well as it will be uh, uploaded to the website so people can see um, the recording of this meeting. Um, so if people who are present are not keen to be seen, then please switch off your camera. However, I would appreciate if committee members can leave their cameras switched on. And when you start talking, committee members, please can you say who you are because we don't have time for introducing ourselves. But if you can just say who you are and uh, who you represent uh, on this committee, that will be great. Um, the papers for the meeting have been circulated, so we will take them as they have been read. So the presenters uh, are encouraged to present just the key um, um, elements from their presentation rather than taking us for each slide because we have read them. So uh, for the purpose of making sure we don't overrun, please, please just present the key points from your presentation. Um, Apologies. Apologies were, were received from Janine Smurl, who uh, is a representative, a representative of the place boards, and Trisha Dorsey, who is the executive director for nursing. But I think Karen Watts is in attendance on behalf of Trisha. Is that correct, Karen? I saw you somewhere. OK, thank you. Um, OK, so we'll we'll move on through the agenda. Uh, declaration of interest. The, all uh, interests are already um, have been circulated. They are on the declaration of interest register, which is within the park. However, if during the meeting there are other um, interests um, to be declared, which may not have been obvious from the beginning, please, please, can you do that? Um, declare them at the time of speaking, uh, so we can make sure that they are recorded. Um, Minutes from previous meetings. So if I can take the minutes for accuracy uh, or feedback for accuracy first, and then we'll go on to matters arising, please. Um, so if there is any observation on the accuracy of those meetings, uh, minutes, please, can you uh, just raise your hand? Uh, can we use the electronic hand, please, uh, to make sure that uh, we capture your feedback for accuracy? But firstly, I will say thank you so much to Rachel for producing them. Uh, quite an involved meeting. So well done, Rachel, uh, for, for pulling it all together. Much appreciated. So accuracy, any observation on accuracy of the minutes from the last meeting, please? That was the meeting we just held on a Monday, 23rd of January. I can't see any hands up, any electronic hands up. So I will take that I see everyone is happy in relation to accuracy. Uh, matters arising, any matters arising which will not be covered on the agenda, please. So does anyone has any matters arising from the previous meeting? No, nope. I have one. <laughs> uh, my page numbers disappeared. So is item number eight related complaints and feedback, comments and questions from attendees section. Um, I was reflecting about us thinking outside the box how we may be able to deliver some of the services for which we have complaints, but we need to have a, a conversation. And uh, I know it's John Pant who was sort of presenting that, but I was not sure if John is the right person to, to actually have those conversations. So, Mark, if that's possible for us to pick up on that item uh, later, because we, 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 we haven't quite picked up, that up. Um, there, there is a... I'm sure there's different options for us to look how we make sure that uh, we still deliver on those uh, priorities and so on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so good. much. Anybody else with any matters arising, please? No. OK, we'll move on. Thank you. Action log. I'm just wondering if Rachel is possible for us to uh, share the action log quickly, please. Thank you so much. Um, so some of the actions have been completed um, and they are green. Um, the actions identified in the 
or, or shaded in gray. Those are the actions on which we'll have uh, feedback in, at the May meeting. So they are work in progress and there's nothing to, to be reported today. However, if um, you can see your initials and if you have an update on the actions listed here, uh, after the action log was completed. So if you have an update post what is listed already, please raise your hand and update us on that um, on that progress. So I'm thinking about Rebecca here and Paul. That is coming up uh, on the agenda anyway. I'm sure some of it will be covered, but anything else which is not covered, please can you update us now? Um, Aliona, I, I don't know whether you, um, you know, the, the development of co-production is going to be quite a long standing ongoing. I'm happy to update at every meeting, but I don't know whether you want to leave it on the action log or whether We're it... Probably... Yeah. Sorry, Rebecca? Uh, I, I just, I don't know whether it's something you want to leave there or whether it's just something that I can update on as, as we go along. Um... I, I think we'll have probably an agenda item at some meeting soon to have a little bit more of a deep dive into that. But I'm just wondering if you had any, because yes, as you're right, we'll be touching it at every uh, meeting one way or the other. But uh, if there's anything you want to add to what is already uh, listed, then that will be great. Otherwise, we will wait for the next um, meeting when we have a deep dive at it. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Um, Paul, I think you're presenting on the lived experience representatives anyway, um, so we'll cover that later. Yeah. Uh, uh, Alione, I think you probably yeah. can't see my hand. I was going to suggest, should we bring co-production, should we put it onto the forward planner to say that we will do it in you know, two meetings time or in three months time or whatever, so that we've got a definite date, because otherwise it, otherwise these things sort of drift a bit, don't they? It would really be easier for a better okay. I think. Thank you, Frankie. Yeah, your hand came up after I started talking. Apologies. But interestingly enough, uh, whilst we are sort of jumping the gun a bit, at the end of the meeting, we'll be talking about uh, the, the forward planning. So, yes, it will be scheduled into a yearly plan for us to bring it to the, uh, at the relevant meetings. Thank you so much. OK, so if there is no any other updates, you can see some work is still in progress. And oh, we have Paul. It's a smiley face, that's good. So uh, I will move on now if there is no further updates on the action log. Thank you so much. So we'll move on now to the terms of reference, which uh, we have uh, looked at last uh, at the last meeting. Uh, and you might remember that some feedback were provided during the meeting and some were also provided by emails to our colleagues. Uh, since we have incorporated all those feedback into the circulated this time terms of reference, uh, paper. So, um, so that is item number five we're talking about. So if I can have any further feedback on the terms of reference, if there are any, if not, then we will uh, proceed into approving terms of reference, which then can be taken to the ICB board. So any, any further feedback? Frankie? This is probably my fault, because I remember last time saying, oh, I really do think we need to have more patient and community representatives but I wonder if we've gone a bit overboard because it, now it says we wouldn't go ahead with a meeting if we had fewer than 10 people I think we probably would go ahead if we had fewer than 10 people so I, I just the chorus here I would perhaps say that all these people are invited but actually if people can't make it we would still go ahead um okay thank you Frankie we'll have a look at that that's yeah page four of the um, of that section thank you any any other feedback from anybody? Frankie, is that another head, a hand or that is a legacy hand? Okay, now I can't I can't see any more hands up. So virtual hands up. So uh, on that basis, please can the committee approve the terms of reference subject to us just looking and verifying uh, the feedback from Frankie just now. So we can then take it to the board. Do I have the approval from the committee members? Yeah. Yeah, I can see yeah. thumbs up. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed. OK, of course, uh, the terms of reference will be uh, reviewed annually or sooner if there are uh, uh, substantial changes which we have to consider. So this is not the done deal forever. We'll review those terms of reference going forward uh, as and when required. 
Okay, so item number six now in the compli complaints report. Uh, one thing I should have said at the beginning is that, of course, we um, at each item would like um, the attendees to participate. So please, please ask questions. Uh, however, uh, of course, we have a timing uh, for each item. So if we can't manage to answer all the questions, uh, I'll have to cut that agenda item short so we can actually finish the meeting as we uh, planned. However, I have asked Paul to circulate to put in chats the, the email address to which you can send any uh, questions you have. And I think it would be good to get into that. Any questions which you may want to uh, raise prior to the meetings, they are um, emailed in advance. So Paul, if it's okay with you, if you can just circulate in chats the, the email address people can send their questions to, or if we run out of time today and you still have questions on any particular items, please email with the item you want to, to raise, uh, agenda item re, re, uh, relates to, and the question you have, and we'll come back to you or at the next meeting or um, outside the meeting, we'll, we'll, depending on the question, of course. All right, thank you so much. So I will um, I'll move on now to complaints report. John Panto is going to be here, um, but I think um, something happened, he's not able to be present, and Mark is going to pretend to be John for a few minutes. Is that the right, Mark? I am indeed. Thank so uh, yeah, bear with me. But thank you, Eliana, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Mark Burgess. I'm the Executive Director of Patients and Communities for the Integrated Care Board. So it's it's good to be here in the second meeting. So um, j j this is a verbal update, um, but we are intending, John is intending to bring a paper to the May Committee uh, where, where I envisage there will be quite a bit of change potentially around the process. So just to give you a, a quick update, John very helpfully did give me a brief. So essentially at the last meeting, we talked about complaints and how we can improve the process uh, and sink, uh, seek solutions importantly to the uh, to the issues that are raised. So that's what the team and well, that's what work um, is, is ongoing at the moment. Uh, there is change coming uh, in that uh, of, uh, I think we mentioned last time we're expecting full delegation of primary care to come to the integrated care board. So it won't just be general practice, it will be also optometry, uh, pharmacy uh, and other areas as well. So uh, there will need to be a new process uh, from the 1st of July. Uh, we need to take into consideration the um, uh, Ombudsman new complaints handling standards uh, and think about how that, that's going to be incorporated. So that will be happening. So th that is the plan. So in, in May, we'll bring uh, a paper which will outline uh, a lot of that detail and we'll be very keen for, for feedback from, from members uh, as to how that's going to best happen. Um, just to pick up on your point earlier, Aliona, and, and actually some of the re issues raised at the last meeting, one one of the points was around housebound patients and uh, uh, in particular relation in relation to information about covid boosters who's eligible when they should go how they should go and john fed back to me that they met with the vaccination team um, uh, since the last meeting uh, and have um, uh, agreed additional comms that have been going out over the last few weeks. So hopefully that has addressed um, some of that, that feedback and some of those concerns. If not, we're very keen to have feedback. Do, do let us know if not. Um, since the last meeting, there's also uh, been uh, an improved position around the backlog of older complaints. Um, has reduced since the last meeting. We discussed that last time. Uh, and importantly, we're looking at uh, an improved escalation process. Obviously, the complaints team themselves don't have all the answers. They need to go out to other areas of the organisation and external uh, provider organisations as well, often to gather the information to be able to provide a full, comprehensive and appropriate response um, when, when those complaints do come in. So um, that's part of the work that, that's ongoing there. Uh, and the only other thing to add uh, ahead of the next update, next paper to the next meeting, is with those that additional responsibility coming to ICBs that I mentioned around um, primary care, we have been informed that we think there are two uh, additional whole time equivalent posts coming across from NHS England to support us. Um, uh, you know, we have very real concerns around dentistry, of course, across Norfolk and Waveney, and there's lots of lots of activity ongoing in that area. So we want to make sure that we can do a good good job in responding to issues raised by patients and you know that can be quite labour intensive so it's good that we've now uh, identified some additional resource to come and work with us. So I'll probably pause at that point Aliana but very happy to take any questions try and answer them if I can on John's behalf if not we will of course respond in, in, in due course. Thank you very much Mark and please uh, say thank you to John for the update he sent to you. Karen I think Karen has a question for us. 
Um, I'm so sorry, Aliona. I meant to do my thumbs up, but now my hand won't go down. So okay. I'm having problems with it. So just ignore me and I'll wave if I have a question. Thank you. Thank you. Paula. Thank you, Aliona. Thanks, Mark, for the update. Um, may not be able to answer this question there and then, but uh, really, really exciting that the ICB is going to be charged with commissioning these additional services. But um, I'm also interested, um, and uh, my latest chair would, would, would want me to ask about delegation to police boards and how that's going to work. I'm sure there's a lot of process going on in the background. I don't know if you can say anything on that, please. I'm asking the question in relation to patients and community may want to really get the community involved in this. Yeah, absolutely, Paula. And and uh, exciting is one word, isn't it? I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a massive portfolio. And genuinely, I think there are people in our organisation who uh, think that we can make a real difference at an ICB level. But yes, of course, at place level to to improve things for patients over. It's, it's not going to be done overnight, of course. It's going to take us some time, some months and years. But I think there is real opportunity, as you've highlighted. Um, in terms of how that works, Paula, we there's still lots of work ongoing. I don't think we've landed it quite yet. However, uh, just to share with you, we met with all chief execs of the main providers and ICB colleagues as a system, uh, I think it last week or the week before, uh, and there was real commitment to support uh, developments at place. Uh, around this. So it, it was m more around gaining commitment to the, the direction of travel to really kind of boost uh, and empower place. Um, I think we're some way off yet talking, you know, confirming delegated budgets and things of that nature. But uh, I, it's work that's very live and happening now. It's not something that we are kicking into the long grass, Paula. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Paula. Any other questions for Mark, please? I can't see any raised hands. Mark, one from me is an observation or feedback from patients um, who I was talking to recently who were trying to uh, raise complaints about a number of various providers, in fact. Um, but they were given email addresses only to raise the complaints via. And as soon as I was saying this is the email address, they were saying, oh dear, I don't have access to the internet. And I'm sure you can imagine that some people uh, may not be able to to use that. So uh, I would just like to, to sort of encourage that we think about alternative ways for people to raise their complaints, not just by email, please. It, it yeah, may be there, it's just probably we don't know, I don't know, but it's just reassurance that there is another way. Absolutely. So um, I, I'm, if, if I suggest, Aliana, I'll take that as an action for John to incorporate an update in the next next paper in May, if that's Thanks OK. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. OK, um, I cannot see any other raised hands, so we'll probably move on. Thank you so much uh, again. OK, uh, item number seven, lift experience committee members update. So um, we started discussion at the previous meeting and we know that Paul Hemingway and Rebecca are working uh, on this uh, um, issue. I know we have uh, quite a bit of progress has been made since. Uh, and a draft pack has been prepared and I think was circulated to uh, a number of partner agencies for helping us to develop that pack so we get it as right as possible. Um, so the, the work has taken place, but it would be good to know exactly where we are now and where we are heading and what we have achieved so far. So, Paul, I think I'll pass it over to you for you to bring us up to speed. Thanks, Aliona. So, hi, everybody, um, and great to see you all again. So since the last meeting, um, the pack that we brought to the meeting in January, we've made um, considerable tweaks to that pack and that incorporated feedback both from committee members as well as any feedback that we've had via email and other conversations. That pack is now on the ICS website and we have circulated that pack to partner organisations, stakeholders, members of the VCSE sector and many others to seek their views on the process as well as for seeking their views on how we can make the process as accessible, easy and basically making sure that we don't actually create, the, create an industry of this so that actually it's open, it's accessible, it's friendly, it's engaging and it really 
points out the importance of our lived experience representatives on this committee um, and what we'd like to see. So where we're at now with that, um, we've also got some individual conversations that Rebecca and I will be having over the coming weeks with some individuals just to have that more granular formal conversation. Once we've got all the feedback from that process, which I think is exactly the right thing to do, but please challenge me if you disagree, um, we will then formalise the pack and then go out to recruit in a very informal, widely engaging way. So it won't be NHS jobs. It won't be via a particular platform. It will simply be a pack that's an accessible pack that is distributed and circulated far and wide across Norfolk and Waverney by the ICB, via trusts, via providers, via the VCSE sector, with the support of Health Watch, Norfolk and Health Watch Suffolk and others. We will then use that recruitment process um, using an expression of interest rather than a formal application because that's not appropriate in this situation either. either, either. So we'll do that in a very open, transparent way. And the intention will be that we'll try to complete that exercise within the next few months with the intention that we'll do this exercise in a very staged, very specific way so that we have our lived experience representatives recruited, actually not the word recruited, selected to be able to join the committee at the absolute latest in July. And one, the main reason why I say July is because we don't want to rush this. We've got to do it in a proper staged way that's supportive for the people that we are trying to reach out to but equally so that all partners and all individuals and organisations across the system can do this with us, because this is not just for NHS Norfolk and Waverley, this is for the integrated care system. So I'll stop there, but if anybody's got any specific questions or any observations or they'd like to be involved more, please do let me know and we can take it from there. Thank you, Paul. Frankie, I think Frankie has a question. Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks, Eliana. Um, Paul, not so much a question, more um, I wonder if you might want to say a few words about um, how we we'll ensure that people with lived experience aren't out of pocket by volunteering and working with us, because I, I know, but probably others don't. So I think it's probably worth airing it. Absolutely. So we're doing a big piece of work within the ICB and working with partners across the uh, system to look at having a standard volunteer expenses um, and co-production policy um, so that people can engage with us in very meaningful ways and make sure that they are compensated for their time um, in line with other organisations across the system, as well as looking at what other systems outside of Norfolk and Waverley um, pay people for their time and their views and their experience and their insight. So there's a piece of work that we've already initially taken to the ICB executive, which has kickstarted this really important journey for consistency across the system. And we're very, very near the latter stage of that being finalised. So we'll hopefully, by the time we go out to recruit our lived experience representatives, it will be in line with the wider ICB system policy expenses procedure that will also be co-designed with partners across the system. So there won't be any, um, oh, well, actually, with this organisation, I get £10, but with this organisation, I get £18. So we're doing it in a very systematic, coordinated way to, to, to avoid that happening. Thank you, and thank you for clarifying. It's good to know that uh, we're taking a system approach to that, Paul. Uh, it would have been a concern of mine if we had very different arrangements. Uh, thank you. Cathy? Thanks. Thanks for that, Paul. Um, I, I understand that it, that it's, you know, it's got to be a, a process that we need to go through, but I'm curious as to why such a long process, given that we started in January and you don't envisage people coming on board until July. That's, that's six months. To get a couple of people on board, it seems lengthy to me. So, so I'd hope that we could potentially get people recruited, well, selected sooner than July. 
But what we have to be really mindful about here, Kathy, is that actually we're doing this to a very wide ranging audience. And actually some people might need more, far more support than others to be able to actually join the committee, be representative, support with paperwork, support with papers, because what we're not necessarily doing is just going out to the big wide world to say we've got this new job and it's this banding and this is what you will have to do. So what we're doing is we're being quite open and quite mindful they're actually it might take it might take not as long as we we're suggesting but actually rather than just do it very quickly and very hastily we're just building and bedding time on our side to make sure that we can do it in a very open way and in a very accessible way because actually what we're also mindful of is that we're not necessarily just going out to recruit two people and we did agree that at the previous meeting. So we're going to be going out probably to a wider pool to make sure that all um, ages, living con um, people with um, long term conditions and different perspectives were recruited in. So we're kind of setting ourselves no later than July, but it could be before. OK, all right. Thank, thanks thank for you. the explanation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for clarifying, Paul. But I also suspect that if when the pack is ready and we're ready to go with it, uh, we don't have to wait to have the whole representation. I think we can, because if we don't get the right, uh, you know, what we really want to have from the outset, we can add. It's not, uh, again, start and finish piece of project. As long as we yeah. make progress and as long as we start engaging people as soon as possible, yeah? Uh, and I can take Kathy's point um, that we do need to, to make sure we engage people as soon as we can. Uh, Rebecca? Thank you. Yeah, it's just really to to, to make the point that um, I don't think we've ever really done this before. I mean, we have not had an ICS before. We've not done it before. Want to do it properly. And also that's the nature of co-production. If you take people along from the start, it takes much it's, it takes much longer. Um, we also didn't necessarily have our policy in place for payment. So I think that would have been not desperately helpful trying to recruit when we didn't have some of that thinking done. And also what we make very clear in the co-production payments and expenses policy is that we want to look at non-financial non payments as well. So not everyone will be off if, if, if they're taking part in co-production or if they're a lived experience member, they will be offered payments. But actually everyone can be offered um, the word that gets used to us is reciprocity, mutual mutual aid, mutual benefit. You know, it, it might be volunteering, shadowing, um, helping with CV, you know, things that you can put on a CV. We just want to sort of explore lots of other um, things and uh, it's just going to take time to to do all that. And it just sort of struck me that we should co-produce this. <laughs> Which is, yeah. which is taking Thank place, you. Rebecca, and, and that was, yeah. uh, was a very good move. So well done for yeah. thinking that. <laughs> yeah. um, so thank you. Uh, I don't see any other questions or hands raised, but uh, I guess what would be good is for us to have uh, the May meeting, have a, uh, an update, see the pack, the co-produced pack, and, uh, and hopefully we would have been uh, already in the process of uh, appointing people to, to this role. So uh, good luck with that. Uh, and we'll look forward to, to to get that update and get people around the table or around the virtual room. Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Um, OK, item number eight is commissioning and contracting in NHS Norfolk and Waveney. Um, I had a, a number of discussions with various people uh, in the community who are very concerned about where uh, what's happening to the commissioning with the ICB, because as we all know, the ICB is really much changed from that of uh, the CCG, uh, it is wider now and so on. So just to, to reassure people, we have invited Roy, Roy Weston to actually give us an update where we are and actually what the role of the ICB is from commissioning and contracting perspective. So uh, Mark, is, is Roy already on the call? Yes. So I would like to, to welcome Roy uh, and uh, pass it on to him for him to um, update us on where we are and what the thinking is and where we are heading. Thank you, Roy. Thank you and uh, hello everybody, nice to meet you all. Um, I, there was a presentation circulated with the papers for the meeting, I believe. And there we go, on the, <laughs> on the screen as we speak. Um, so I'm just going to give you a, a, a quick summary of um, commissioning and contracting in uh, NHS Norfolk and Waveney. And as Aliena says, uh, the ICB now uh, has a slightly different focus from the preceding um, 
uh, CCGs uh, who operated kind of on a smaller footprint. So um, our role now um, is to be what's called a strategic commissioner for the system. Um, so previously, uh, our CCGs and, and prior to that, the PCT would have commissioned every individual healthcare service that was required for patients in Norfolk and Waveney. Now, we're in a slight transition period at the moment where we are effectively continuing to do that um, as the ICB, but our focus is shifting uh, in that we effectively have a dual role. Uh, we will still be the, the the overall commissioner for healthcare services for the system, but the way in which we deliver that might be slightly different. So our our aim is still to um, commission services for uh, patients as required in our constitution commitments, uh, ensure that patients have equitable access no matter where they are in, in the system, the services are consistent across Norfolk and Waveney, um, and that they are delivered in accordance with the specifications and standards that are are mandated either by us locally as the Commission or, or nationally by the NHS. Um, if we can just move on to the next slide, please. So um, a little bit about our current work plan. So um, we hold quite a few contracts. So currently, um, when I wrote this slide, 285 clinical service contracts, that numbers generally increasing almost um, every day, um, particularly at this time of year. And this is our financial year end and we're putting contracts in place for services that commence from the 1st of April now. Um, <clears throat> our annual budget for Norfolk and Waveney is £2.2 billion, pounds, uh, which sounds like an awful lot of money. But when you think about how many patients or potential service users there are uh, in Norfolk and Waveney, it's not an awful lot per head. Um, but uh, it, it does get spread across quite a wide range of um, mental health, community, acute services, uh, plus uh, quite a few um, additional services now that support healthcare services as we work more with uh, voluntary sector organisations and the charitable sector. Uh, so currently we have uh, 17 procurements that were completed uh, in 22-23. Um, as a result of which we awarded over 50 individual contracts. So obviously there were uh, procurements that resulted in uh, multiple providers um, being awarded contracts. Uh, our current work plan, uh, we've got 13 live procurements underway. Uh, we have 30 plus uh, procurements planned uh, for 2023-24. Uh, that includes two significant uh, procurements around major services. So one is our non-emergency patient transport service uh, and the other one relates to uh, the provision of 111 and out of hours care. So they're, they're quite big uh, procurement projects that will be taken uh, over, undertaken during the year. Uh, could you move on to the next slide please? Um, so a little bit more about the future uh, procurement and contracting. So we have a rolling program of uh, review of our contracts. So we, we maintain a, a database of all the contracts we have. Uh, we monitor them both for delivery of services in year and also to um, plan in advance of their expiry what we will be doing when they end. So if a contract expires and we intend to continue with the service, uh, we have to consider how we would award a further contract. Do we need to procure it or, or are we able to make a, a direct award? Um, but the, the aim remains to be, it remains that, that we want to uh, deliver greater stability of our services, um, but also reduce the admin workload associated with maintaining those. This kind of uh, management overhead costs are something we're very focused on uh, currently. Uh, so when we do get to the end of contracts, we are considering uh, what we do when we replace them to deliver greater cost efficiencies or improved service uh, alignment across the system or improvement in service in, deli in service delivery. Um, but there's a there's always a, a balance to be struck between um, the, the kind of services that we deliver and delivering efficiencies uh, for the system as a whole. Uh, and the next slide, please. And then uh, finally, um, I, I talked about our change in role as becoming the strategic commissioner, um, but our preceding role as CCGs to be the, the effectively the commissioner of everything. So um, whilst we are 
uh, as an ICB thinking about how services should be delivered across the entire system, uh, we're now working at place level, uh, so the, the smaller geographical areas, to ensure that services meet the, low, the needs of the local population. Uh, so we, as everyone knows, we have slightly varying needs depending on um, the population in any, any given area. So it will be different for a, a rural area compared, compared to one of our major cities, for example, and we have to take that into account. Uh, and we work now at place level to ensure that we uh, reflect the needs of the local population. Um, we're doing a lot more uh, around engagement and co-production now, um, engaging with people, patients and, and their families. So the work that this group, I'm sure, is particularly interested in to make sure that the services that we design uh, reflect the needs of uh, our population. Uh, and then we're working uh, or trying to work in a in a far more um, aligned way with our voluntary sector partners. So there's quite a large number of voluntary and charitable sector organisations in Norfolk and Waveney who, who play a, a very valuable part in delivering our services. So how we engage with that sector um, is, a, is one of the kind of um, major pieces of work that we're doing to make sure that we make the most of the, the services that are available and support that the voluntary sector can give. Um, it's always been difficult to engage with the voluntary sector because these organisations are quite small. Um, but the, the arrangements we're putting in place now uh, make it uh, easier for us to uh, plan our services, reflecting the, the additional support that the uh, voluntary sector can provide. Um, and we are trying to create time so that we can uh, think about how we transform services rather than uh, responding to urgent need. Uh, we're trying to preempt those needs uh, and develop and design services that will meet the needs of the population both now uh, and into the future. So I hope that gives you a, a bit of a snapshot of what the ICB does currently uh, and the way in which we work, but I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has any. Thanks so much, Roy. Thank you. Whilst people are thinking of questions, I've got three, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. The first one, uh, the engagement to the VCSC sector, we have the VCSC assembly, uh, and uh, it, it, that will be a very good mechanism of engaging with the sector um, in terms of planning, as well as uh, clearly contracting, if they're successful. Um, the, the two things which are um, of sort of pertinence to me is contracts. Uh, are we moving into outcomes-based contracting? Um, so uh, are we building into the procurement uh, the requirement for the providers to demonstrate that they're actually making a difference to our communities, that they are improving health? And what kind of indicators are we using for that? Please, if that can be uh, taken into account and at some point we can be updated on it. Uh, and, uh, and the other one, and I should have written it down, um, I was curious about the type of contracting now. How much is it payment by results? So it's linking in a way to the outcomes based and so on. Uh, as I now at the moment is predominantly, predominantly linked to numbers, but it'll be good to see payments by result linked to, uh, to, to outcomes if that contracting is still uh, going ahead with. Uh, and how much is block contract and on what basis that is done? So it's, it's quite a, a lot there, but it, it is something for us to understand better. <laughs> Because at the end of the day, we want to achieve a difference to our local communities in terms of improving their health and reducing inequalities. So how do that all links? Yes, OK. Um, so <laughs> that's the, there's quite uh, a lot to answer there. I'll, I'll try and keep <laughs> it brief. Um, your, your second point first, um, you're right. Uh, we are looking at uh, outcome based contracts and have been for some time, actually. Um, and there's there's more work going on currently about the ICB role being one of uh, commissioning uh, services that deliver improvements in the health of our population. So that's effectively what an outcome-based contract is expected to do. Um, there's there's a, a degree of um, trust involved in that because uh, if you commission for outcomes, uh, you have to be confident that the provider will be delivering those outcomes. Uh, and traditionally, uh, we've kind of been uh, more focused on uh, some of the mechanics about how services get delivered. Uh, so there's a there's that co-production piece where 
we're working with providers about how services should be delivered, but the measures that will be um, performance managing organisations against will be more and more about outcomes and improvements of the health of our population. But that's that's that'll be a a gradual process because there's, there's quite a lot of change involved in doing that. Mm. Um, and then the point about um, whether these are activity based or outcome based payments, um, it's a bit of a mixed economy and always has been. Um, it will continue to be um, uh, at the moment, for example, um, NHS nationally are very focused on uh, delivering the recovery, the what's called elective recovery. So dealing with the backlogs of patients, the waiting lists of patients waiting for elective care in hospitals. So uh, to incentivize that, uh, all of our um, NHS providers, our hospital providers uh, will be paid for activity they deliver uh, in 23-24, so the surgical interventions, rather than a block arrangement, uh, which it has been for the last three years. So there are changes uh, coming. I'm sure that there will be a shift once we've kind of delivered the elective recovery part. I'm sure there will be a shift away from activity based payments again, um, uh, back to uh, more of an outcome based arrangement. Thank you, Roy. Thank you so much. OK, I'll go to Mark and then to Suzanne. Thanks, Elena. Thanks, Roy. Really helpful update. Um, Roy, Roy, I keep reflecting. It's actually, I think, it's a really kind of difficult job you've got uh, at the moment because the world is changing. You know, it used to be far more simple when it was just straight contracts. One could uh, argue between provisions, uh, commissioners and providers. Um, in some respects, it feels like procurement law, procurement rules haven't quite caught up with the way we're working now in that this is all about co-production, how do we work together, how do we work with those that are in the system. Is, is there any sight of, um, I, I know it's difficult, but is there any sight of that changing any time soon, Roy? Because, uh, you know, we want to involve everyone, we want to work together, but that actually makes it quite difficult as well, doesn't it? It does, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and I'm pleased to say that there is uh, change in sight. There has been um, changes to the procurement uh, regulations for healthcare services that have been going through Parliament for quite some time now. Uh, the latest I heard is it's likely to be July that we will have what's called the provider selection regime come into effect. Um, that's a different procurement regime which will allow us to make uh, uh, contract awards to providers that we are um, confident are able to deliver services and we have worked with uh, to develop new services for example uh, <clears throat> uh, currently without having to go through the the competitive procurement process that the current regime requires so there's this conflict at the moment that you you're alluding to between collaboration which is what we want to do and the legal requirement for us to compete uh, for services when we want to award contracts and we're hoping that the provider selection regime will make the collaboration easier for us to deliver. Mm -hmm. that, that's good news. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Suzanne. Hello, I, I'm Suzanne Meredith. I'm um, Deputy Director of Public Health at Norfolk County Council. I also have a new role working with Frankie on population health management. And one of my roles as Deputy Director is also um, linking up with health intelligence and the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment. And so I, you mentioned a lot there, um, Roy, about commissioning services to meet the needs of the local population. I just wondered, does your team undertake formal health needs assessments as part of that? And how do they link up with the joint strategic needs assessment? Because I was thinking maybe there's something we can do to link together. And if there was a pipeline of things for the future, we could perhaps work together to to form some some health needs assessments that fitted your, your commissioning pipeline? So, so um, I can't lay claim to um, being responsible for commissioning. Uh, that, that sits with other people within the organisation. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, and there are there are quite a lot of people uh, involved in commissioning of healthcare services. Um, my, my main focus is on um, the procurement side of things and then the contracts that, that follow. Um, however, um, we have always taken into account um, the health needs assessment when when commissioning services um, and I'm pleased to say we are working uh, ever more closely with local authorities now when we're looking at what the health needs of the population are and how we can deliver 
uh, health improvement. So rather than, um, you've probably heard the expression, the NHS isn't really a health service, it's a sickness service. We treat illness at the moment. Uh, and our target is to improve health uh, through population health management and other means. Uh, and that will entail greater working with um, the, the local authorities and the social care sector to, to improve the well-being of our, our population. Thank you. Um, I can't see any more raised hands. Um, I remembered my third observation, Roy, so I need to share that uh, before we move to the next item. Uh, thinking about actually on the back of what Susanna is talking about and linking it to the place planning, of course, there are conditions which do not relate just to geographical place. There are conditions which population will experience them because of the aging process, whatever that might be. So my plea really is that, um, if at all, can we avoid postcode lottery in planning our services? Because there are services which are not available universally to everyone. It depends where people live, if they get it or not, although that condition exists in that area. So. It's just something to be in the back of our mind that whilst, of course, we want to have a targeted approach, at the same time, we must not lose uh, sight of conditions which are not geography or, 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 or I don't know, community need type driven, if that makes sense. Absolutely. That, that's one of the fundamental uh, roles of the ICB now as a strategic commissioner to ensure that we have that consistent access to services across the whole of the system. Um, mm. the, the place level work is more about making sure that in delivering those, we recognise the needs of local populations as well. Lovely. Thank you for that reassurance. Thank you, Roy. Um, still no any more hands. So on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for making the time to come and update us on all of this. And we'll look forward to seeing in the, in the very near future what how, how you progressed with all the interesting areas of work you're highlighting to us earlier on. So good luck with that transformation. Thank you, Roy. Thank you very much. Nice Thank you. Um, OK, we'll move on to item nine. Um, I understand Tracy Williams is here. I think Tracy had some exciting half an hour earlier on, but I think yeah. she's here now. I am uh, indeed here, yeah. <laughs> lovely. Uh, welcome. Uh, Tracy, um, before you arrived, uh, I, I sort of informed everyone that um, we take uh, all the items as read, so people would have read the, the pack, uh, and um, we, we are inviting uh, the presenters to just pick up on the key elements of, of the message they would like to, to give to us. Uh, so we can have the time for questions uh, and discussion. So uh, as we now, and Roy just now uh, in his presentation was talking about the health inequality and um, our, our plans to reduce those inequalities and improve the health outcomes. Uh, and of course, this is a big part of what the ICB and the system overall should be focusing on. So we now that lots of energy is being put into achieving that, uh, and I'm sure that Tracy will, will update us on where we are currently at uh, in this area of work. But of course, uh, health inequalities and reducing those inequalities go across day to day life of everything we do uh, and the achievement of health outcomes and improvement of those outcomes. So Tracy, without any more introduction, I still can't see you on the screen, but I'm sure you'll appear. Oh, I'll I hope pass everybody on else to can you, see please. me. I, I am here. Yeah. I did, did have a presentation, which I'll try to go through. That's OK. I think Rachel might kindly put that up for me, if that's all right. So, yeah, I do yeah. apologise for my delay this afternoon. We had a bomb scare in the building that I'm working from. So, um, yes, I couldn't get into back into the building until just about five minutes ago. So I'm Tracy Williams. I'm the Clinical Lead for Health Inequalities uh, for the ICB and also for Children and People and Maternity. And this afternoon, I'm just going to run through um, some things in respect of health inequalities, just a little bit of background setting a little bit about the core 20 plus 5 framework, some of the achievements that, that we've had in the, within the ICB to date, and also some of our challenges and some of our ambitions for the future. I think this builds on the presentation you had at the last Patient and Communities Committee from Rod Drakeman in respect of population health management. Um, and you would have seen all these slides in the packs. So I won't go in them into great detail. So, so we know that health inequalities are ultimately about those differences in the state of people's health. And that's that's affected by many things. And it's actually people's ability to access health care and the things within their life that affects us that ability to access health care, which impacts on their health status. So that, in fact, might be 
how long somebody lives. It might be the access and the quality of that availability of care. It might be that experience of that care. And it might be elements in their life that focus on behavioural risks, such as are they smokers? Are they drinking too much alcohol potentially? So all those kind of things and also those wider determinants. So where somebody lives, their education, their employment, all those kind of elements. And I think it's always important to remember that the, the causes are quite the causes of health inequalities are complex and they vary. And I think we need to remember that it's about equality. So they're there for everybody, but it's about equity of being able to access those services. If we could just go on to the next slide, please. Oh, somebody in control of my slides. Ah, super. So as I said, those factors are kind of complex they interlink and some of the main factors that we know is those social economic and areas of deprivation that people might live in and those wider determinants also it's the geography so do i live in a, a, a polluted area for example do it do a community live in a rural or a coastal area or an urban area um, there's elements around protected characteristics, which we know certainly depending on your ethnic background, depending on if you have a disability, if you have learning disability or autism, for instance, that you might in fact find access to healthcare a little bit more challenging. And then we have a group of patients or some of our communities that are known as inclusion health groups and more vulnerable groups. And that includes our gypsy and travellers, includes people experiencing homeless, forced migrants such as asylum seekers and refugees and vulnerable women such as sex workers. And again, they're often complex and overlapping. So if we just move on to the next slide. As an integrated care board, we do have a statutory duty to address inequalities. And so just reading out that each integrated care board must in the exercise of its functions have regard to the need to reduce inequalities between persons with respect to their ability to access health services and reduce inequalities between patients with respect to the outcomes achieved in them by the provision of health services. And that includes outcomes as well. So. NHS England has identified five priority areas for ICBs and this relates really to the fact I think following the the main phases of the pandemic we, we saw an expo exposure of health inequalities that really did expose that certain members of our community our population really were on the kind of end of suffering from more health inequalities than the rest of the population. So some of the priorities for us as an ICB is to restore our services inclusively for all communities to mitigate against digital exclusion, to ensure that our data sets are complete and timely so we know our people, we know where they are, we know how they're accessing care and their experiences of that care, that we accelerate our preventative programmes, which is, for instance, our smoking cessation programmes, our weight management programmes, many things that we have to prevent ill health in the longer term and support people's access to those. And that includes our core 20 plus five approach, which is a health inequalities improvement framework, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a little while. And then the, the fifth element is that we strengthen leadership and accountability. So if we can just move on to the next slide. I think at the population health presentation at the last meeting, we talked a little bit about core 20 plus five, but it's basically a tackling health inequalities framework for the NHS. And core 20 is that we're focusing on our most deprived 20% of our communities, which is ranked in accordance to index of mortal de deprivation. And then we have other groups that might be um, more vulnerable and at, at, at risk of, of having poorer health outcomes, and they're known as our plus communities. And that in, it includes communities that locally we might, we might identify through our own population health management approaches. And there's some given groups in that. So inclusion health groups, for instance. So the groups I just mentioned previously are a given group that they're a plus group with any ICB, ICS area. There's a framework for adults, um, which focus on maternity um, programmes of care and personalised care for pe pregnant people. Um, there's SMI, so increase in our severe, men, um, multiple, se severe mental illness health checks within our system. There's chronic respiratory disease. These are the adults' domains. And in respect of chronic respiratory disease, we want to increase the, the access to vaccinations such as COVID, pneumonia and flu vaccinations. We want to diagnose cancer much early, earlier than we do at the moment because we know that the earlier we diagnose cancer and treat cancer, the better the prognosis is for people. And we want to find people that have high blood pressure because clearly treating that at an optimum earlier time is going to be much better. 
And then we also have five domains in these clinical domain areas for children and young people. So that includes asthma. So just to hopefully prevent children have, having acute asthma exacerbations. Another domain is around diabetes. So it's supporting children and young people to access continuous glucose monitoring and insulin pump therapy. There's another area around epilepsy. So it's for any young person, child that has um, autism and a learning disability can access specialist learning um, epilepsy services. And then we have a domain around oral health so that for under 10s, any access to have dental extractions for tooth decay is not overly delayed. And then there's an element around mental health. So if we just move on to the next slide, which explains in Norfolk and Waveney that we have 42 communities across Norfolk and Waveney where the populations are amongst the most 20 percent most deprived in England are core 20 and you can see from the map where those communities are um, as a kind of an approximate 40 percent of the population of Great Yarmouth and Norwich live in the most deprived 20 percent areas in England um, but compared to the rest of Norfolk, we have 16% of the population in those deprived areas. And, and these charts, which I'm sure you've seen as you've had the slide deck showed, can show where those communities are and those numbers. So if we can just move on to the next slide. And just, just to say that those communities... Tracy, those 40... Tracy can I just... Sorry. Um, yeah, speak um, to me up? But yes, I am uh, concerned about the time. Okay, so yes, I'll speed up. Just, mm -hmm, yeah, thank you. certainly. So those 42 communities are at district ward level area. Um, so this slide just talks about some of those inclusion health groups and some of the groups that we're more concerned about. Um, if we just go straight through the next two slides, which focus on the core 20 plus five and infographics, which I think you can all see. And then I just wanted to talk about some of our key achievements. So we are developing our strategies for health inequalities and population health management. We are implement our new board structure for population health management, health inequalities with a new population health and health inequalities board. We're working with our place based boards and our health and wellbeing partnerships in order that we can link in addressing inequalities in those wider determinants. And we'll continue with a real focus on inclusion health groups. We have a system wide inclusion health um, network that consists of our district councils, voluntary community sector organisations and statutory services, including prisons, police and public health colleagues. We're developing our quality impact assessments and the action plans that surround those. And we're working as a, a system to develop and implement a system wide digital inclusion strategy. Um, You've heard at this meeting before about our Community Voices project, and that's expanding with those insights work into how people access services and their experience of that, and with developing that along with community connectors and champions as well. We do have 20 core 20 plus ambassadors that are um, colleagues across the system, both in provider organisations, in acute trusts, community trusts, mental health trusts, and in primary care. So they can really take and support this agenda for us. And we're developing our Wellness on Wheels programme, um, which I've got a couple of slides, which I'll talk about that very briefly shortly. And we've also um, developed other projects such as how the NHS can be an anchor institution and consider some of those social economic um, determinants. And then we've got a really exciting project, which is linking to our Protect Now, which is Active Now, so Active Norfolk and Waveney, how we support people into exercise. And we've had some really good referrals from some of those core 20 areas into that programme, which is really quite exciting. And perhaps we can bring that to another meeting. So just a quick couple of case studies, if that's OK, if we move on to the, the next slide. This is our Wellness on Wheels bus so a wow bus and as you can see the graph shows or the, the map shows where it's visited across Norfolk and Avney which tends to be in our areas of deprivation visiting hostels for instance visiting um, asylum seekers that may be resident hotels but certainly traveling across and offering a range of services originally it based itself on COVID vaccinations and um, addressing inequalities in vaccinations, but we introduced a range of services, which you can see there that are detailed. The latest one that we're trialling this week at Social Supermarket is Health Checks, so NHS Health Checks, so we're very excited about that. So just moving on to the next slide, if that's okay. We, as you're probably aware from, from media, there's an increase in uh, small boat crossings of asylum seekers into the UK. We have uh, four hotels across Norfolk and Waveney and we've been able to develop a support service. Um, we work very closely with Norfolk County Council's people from abroad team. We have an integrated healthcare team with that social work team that are supporting that 
um, access to primary health care, registrations at GP practices, undertaking a holistic health assessments and absolutely linking in. And further, we're, we're working with all of our practices in Norfolk and Waveney under an Inclusion Health Locally Commission service. And 105 of our practice, all 105, have signed up to be inclusion friendly. So they will not exist on proof of identity or redress when people try to register with them. They will be more engaging, supportive. They will undertake some training around inclusion health and showing there are safe surgery for people to go to. And there's further elements where some practices have clinical champions within the practice. And then a third element where some practices provide outreach support, for instance, to our gypsy room and traveller sites, and also to um, other areas such as hostels, night shelters, um, various things. Just moving on very quickly to some of our challenges. We know that our geography is a challenge. We have rural and coastal communities. Um, it's a complex system with its size. We have eight, eight health and wellbeing partnerships and five place boards, which we need to make sure there's not duplication and that they meet with each other, they connect with each other, but also there's opportunities there. Uh, we do have overlapping district and county council boundaries, such as Waveney and Breckland, and the impact on how local people might access services. But certainly, again, there's opportunities for how we work together. We need to ensure that connectivity, as I said, between the place based board and the health and wellbeing partnerships and, and ensure that our systems governance supports those structures. Um, it's a big area. We want to embed health inequalities in all that we do. So we need to ensure we have capacity within the ICB to support that. And I think data, currently we know that not all of our data sets are linked, but certainly there's a lot of work going on in that, that area. So we do, do have that. Um, we're looking to do that and improve our data quality. So just moving on to some of our ambitions, if that's OK, that's my last slide. So we do want to embed addressing health inequalities in all that we do and at every level of our ICS, which will encompass into our health inequality strategy. For those communities and people in by health inequalities the most, we want them to have equitable access, excellent experiences and optimal outcomes and to have a voice in how services are developed and supported to access them. We want to focus on those 42 most deprived wards with, across our system. And we also want our people, so our workforce, to see health inequalities as their every, everybody's business. So it, it's fundamental to their everyday work. And I think we consider how that, that might manifest into mandatory training and the culture of our ICS moving forwards. Um, we have just launched our health inequalities, health inclusion web pages on the website and I can share the link in the chat, um, but happy to take any questions. Sorry, that oh, was a whistle stop tour. <laughs> it was indeed. Thank you so much, Tracy. Uh, lots of interesting work is taking place in all sorts of interesting areas. So uh, well done for doing that. Um, we have five, six minutes for questions. Uh, I am um, Whilst I'm waiting for people to generate those questions, I have a couple, please. Um, can we please at some point see the health inequality strategy? Uh, if that can be circulated, maybe at the next board meeting, so we can at least know what's included in it and where we are heading, if that's OK. So that, that was the first one, and I'm sure you'll tell me in a minute what's happening to it. And the second one, uh, just going back to the Wellness on Wheels bus, of course, there are other mobile services uh, delivered across Norfolk, and it will be good to bring um, the, those projects together because they can support each other. Uh, and I'm aware that some of them are going exactly to the areas you are targeting. So I think it will be good to, to integrate services which are not necessarily provided by the, the ICB at the moment. So, um, yeah, those are my yeah. observations. Mm -hmm. So the health inequality strategy, we're currently developing. That's, that's one of our key features of the joint forward plan for both health inequalities and population health management. So we're developing those and we will certainly bring them to this committee when they're ready. They're not ready yet. They're a work in progress. We've been supported by Suzanne and her team in public health to do that, but we certainly will bring them in due course to this, this committee. And in respect of the outreach programmes, absolutely, let's just join up what we can and have more impact. So very happy to do that. And Alione, if we can kind of maybe discuss that and link yep. what, what else is happening to the, the Wellness on Wheels programme as it moves out and about around Norfolk and Waveney. Very happy to do that. Excellent. Thank you so much. So I'll go to Frankie now and then to Cathy. Uh, thanks, Aliona. Um, I'm really pleased because my questions really um, complement yours, I think. So um, the first thing I was, I was going to invite Tracy to say a few words about the um, 
PHM and Health Inequalities Board, which is just launches this month, which will be overseeing the development of the strategy and it will then be bringing th those strategies here for sign off. So they're just not yep. ready yet. So that was the first thing. Um, the uh, second thing I just wanted to bring out was place. Uh, on the ambitions um, slide, you haven't mentioned much on, on place, but actually we are intending that each of our new of our place boards as they sort of develop and embed further will be taking on local leadership for health inequalities yes. in their area which should hopefully address exactly what you're talking about Aliona in terms of the wow bus because um you know centrally we cannot be cited on everything that's going on everywhere but actually you know the the Great Yarmouth and Waveney Place Board will know exactly what's going on in Lowestoft and what's what's going on so that was um the second thing so um we hope so we hope so Frankie that they will know exactly what is going on but, but yeah so place <laughs> leadership should really make a big difference there and then just the last thing, um, and Tracy's going to kill me uh, for saying this, but the um, <laughs> but the uh, our plus communities, just to highlight that although the inclusion health groups are are sort of nationally set, we haven't actually formally defined our plus communities yet. So again, that we we need to do that. And so Tracy's pulled out, you know, some very obvious, you know, for example, the rural poor um, are. Uh, particular issue for our system but that might not necessarily be for central London say um, uh, and that's hasn't been completed yet but that is a, a really key piece of work for us. Thank yeah you. I think I think we'll be doing that for our population health management and just seeing what those yep. key communities are but I think certainly I know Suzanne might want to come in there actually because Suzanne's been doing some work with her colleagues in public health and we do know certainly from our children young people perspective so those children in care particularly yeah. those children that are carers are going to be plus groups so yeah there is some work going on but we haven't officially kind of but we, uh, signed but we need those to off. sort of and finish we, it and sign we do. it so we can say we absolutely these are do. our groups and this is why yes we've chosen who yes we've chosen. indeed indeed we do and of course in okay. time that may change so we'll need to yes yeah keep an absolutely eye on them. that's right thank you kathy you and then mark OK, thanks. Thanks, Tracy. That was really insightful. Um, what 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 I'm interested in is what is the take up? For, for example, the bus rolls into um, Yarmouth somewhere. You know, do, do two people turn up or 200 people turn up? You, you know, what what kind of take up are, are you getting on these yeah. initiatives? I, I think it varies and I think we're into quality, not quantity, actually, because certainly with the COVID vaccinations and I mean, Paula knows from the bus probably being in Great Yarmouth and with the connector work, it's it's, it's people that necessarily won't trust our services. We've had great, for instance, in, in Lowestoft, we've had a huge uptake of COVID vaccinations, but it's not just about the vaccinations. Uh, the, the bus is there to do social prescribing. Today it's in Norwich and it's parked outside a social supermarket. So, and we'll be doing kind of work around cost of living crisis and social prescribing, direction signposting. Um, I think it's quality, not quantity. We do have that information. I don't have it to, at hand, but we have have really good feedback and we are evaluating the programme as we go along as well. OK, thanks. Maybe on a future presentation yes. we could see yeah. what take up Absolutely. actually is. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mark. Thank you. And thanks, Tracy. I, I know how passionate you are about inequalities and it's and it kind of it, it filters out through us all. So uh, and it's so mm. important. So two things. Firstly, um, in response to your point, Frankie, uh, about place and the strength of place around this agenda, actually, I think some of the best work that we're seeing is being delivered in place. I know Paula would probably support that. You know, the work with the district councils, with local people, with voluntary sector, and actually some of the best schemes that would probably be quite good in future to bring some of those here, yes. uh, I think will be critical and key. Uh, and the final point, I'm just going to repeat, Tracy. Um, uh, the last point on the slide, I think, is the most important one, which is that, that it's everyone's business. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, uh, and I think as an organisation, that's beginning to soak into our teams and our staff and how we work. And it's about equ equity, not just equality. So, so we're getting there, but we must keep pe pushing that and peddling that. So and I know this committee will absolutely support that. That's yeah, no, that's great. And I think it'd be brilliant to bring back to future meetings some real kind of case studies and some real work that's underway. Certainly there is some great stuff happening at place. It's just too much to bring. But I think specific focus on those would be great for future meetings. It would and we'll welcome that, Trace, and we'll make sure is is uh, agended for that. Thank you so much indeed. Um, I can't see any more hands uh, up, but it's also 10 past four. So we'll move on to the next agenda item. Tracy, thank you again. And thank you to the team you're working with on all of this. So good work and um, keep going.
Thanks Thank so much. You. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, item number 12, health watch updates. Um, I'm very pleased to actually report that we have the representation from both health watch Norfolk and health watch Suffolk uh, on this committee uh, to making sure that we are covering both uh, areas within the um, ICS and ICB um, Norfolk and Waveney. So this is very good uh, move and it is, it is a it, it is a result of our conversation at the last meeting uh, about the representation and the terms of reference. So we put it in practice. Um, within the park, uh, um, we have the presentation which Alex and Andy uh, very kindly sent to us. And I would like to welcome um, both of them. And I cannot see any of them on the screen, but I do know that Judy Sharp is uh, standing in for Alex, so Alex sent his apologies. So I know Judith, you're somewhere there, and uh, Andy, I've seen you earlier. So welcome to both of you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the papers are taking a thread. So what I would like to happen, please, if you can just provide a summary of your papers uh, and please identify anything where you would like our committee to, or this committee to help you in the work you're doing. So I will pass it on to Ways I can't see on the screen, uh, Judith and Andy. So shall we start with Judith? Good afternoon. I'm Judith Sharp and I'm Deputy Chief Executive of Healthwatch Norfolk. And as Aliona has said, I'm here in place of Alex today. So thank you. Um, Alex has provided a very brief overview, a list really, of all the work we're currently undertaking. Some of it's nearly completed, some of it's in the middle, and some of it is yet to begin. There's a huge range in there, and some of it is work that takes two or three months, some of it takes up to three years. So there's a huge range of activity there and um, projects that we are, are currently working on. Um, I'm happy to take questions on any that anyone's particularly interested in, but what I would actually like to point out is these are specific projects, some of which we have determined that we want to look at because the feedback we're receiving from the public dictates that and pharmacy would be the big one on there for that. When we out and about doing our general engagement, talking to the public, the big or in our, our helpline, the phone calls, the emails we receive, the three biggies really that we hear about are access to primary care, dentistry and pharmacy services. So whilst there's this huge range of stuff here that is other stuff, they really are the three biggies. And I would just ask you all to keep that in your heads. <laughs> they are the three biggies that people talk to us about all the time. And whilst it's great to hear that taking decayed teeth out for children under 10 in hospital is there as a priority, it would be even better that we can do something with the commissioning to ensure that they don't get to that stage. Mm -hmm. Because as we all know, there are no NHS dentists for either adults or children. So anything that can be done in the future as commissioning passes across to the ICB on dentistry, any little nuance of contracting that could be done there to improve provision would be brilliant. And I have a question for the committee and maybe I'm wrong to place it right now, but I th I'm here and I've got the floor. So my question is, how will this committee be kept informed of relevant decisions in other committees, such as changes in primary care commissioning that would affect patients and communities? I don't know who could ask answer that question. Well, I think between Mark and I, maybe we can. Mark, do you want to start? And well, we have Frankie here too, who sits on the board. So because there is a connection through the board, of course. But anyway, yes, Mark. So if I make a start, uh, Julie, thanks. Good, great question. And, and actually, uh, you know, this committee has been set up to make sure that the views of patients communities is taken in, but also that it's fed back as well. So, uh, you know, those, there's a there's a an enormous amount of work, the list you've just provided for, for just Healthwatch alone, but there's an enormous amount of, amount of work and projects and initiatives and, and, and changes that are, are going to be happening. I think what, what's important is that people like Aliona, myself, Frankie and many others on this call identify those things that we think are going to be really, um, you know, you, you've highlighted their access, GP access, dentistry, pharmacy, many others, that they, those things are brought here. We don't want to repeat everything that's done in other committees is the, my one note of caution. But I think it's about making sure that we've got that, that balance right. Um, uh, and so that, 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 that it's presented here and that people have the opportunity to feed in and review and comment uh, and, uh, and we keep people informed. So that's a start of tech. We won't get it right every time. And that's why working with people like yourself, Andy and others, that we, we're keen to make sure that we do get this right in the future. 
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mark Paul. And Frankie, I don't know if you want to add to that anything. Paul? Thanks, Aliora. It's just um, a quick um, comment and a thank you, really. So, Judith, absolutely. So, from a primary care perspective, particularly with pharmacy and dentistry coming down to ICBs, what I would really value is actually, particularly the ICB, working even closer with Health Watch Norfolk, Health Watch Suffolk on this big journey ahead, particularly in relation to pharmacy, optometry and dental. Um, so it's great we've got these inroads and good working relationships, but actually, as we move forward, it's absolutely pivotal that wherever this source of information is coming in, we work together on it. So I really, really value that support and cooperation as we have done to now, but definitely into the future. So great. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Yeah. So um, in answer to your specific question, Judith, we are the link. So this committee feeds into board, as do all the other committees. And so the board, you know, it goes up and it comes back down again. But in the meantime, um, Mark, Aliona and, you know, Mark, and I are on the, no, I'm getting it muddled up, who's on which? But anyway, Aliona is the chair of the Quality and Safety Committee, which I and um, Tricia are both uh, members of. Mark is, of course, a member of the Primary Care Commissioning. So, you know, hopefully as a matrix, we, we can crack it. I didn't say that very well, did I? Um, but using your point as inspiration, while I've got the mic, I had a question for Healthwatch. And that was about digital tools. So you, in your paper, you mention um, using digital help, what's using digital tools to help people with hearing difficulties. But I just wondered about the slightly larger question about um, how we reach out to uh, people with digital exclusion. And I, I know it's something we struggle with. And I wondered how whether there was any learning we could get from HealthWatch in terms of how you've done it better, because, you know, for example, using libraries, using uh, social prescribers, community centres to help people to access um, via you know, community resources rather than their own. As Aliona mentioned earlier, you know, just putting an email address to comment is, doesn't help if you haven't got an email or access to the net. No, it's a very quick question, Frankie, and I think the answers and solutions are not quite as easily summed up in one sentence. Um, that particular um, item on the list there, digital tools, is a very specific piece of work, and it's a three-year piece of work, and it will have three separate topics. So the first was about um, access to primary care for people with hearing loss, and that came up with a, a whole host of recommendations and a charter for GPs in terms of helping them help patients with parent, with um, with hearing loss. Um, this year, the focus on that one has been all about um, uh, the shared care record and uh, increasing patient understanding of that and sharing of that. In terms of the, the, how do you get to the people that are, you know, we believe it's about 10% of the population in Norfolk that don't have access to, to the internet. It's not an easy fix. And there's also work that Healthwatch England have done about the accessible information standard in terms of making information accessible to all people in different varieties when they have various impairments or English is not their first language. So there are some recommendations and reports out there to begin to, to help to do that. And I'm quite happy to dig them out and share them if that's a help. Thank you, Judith. Uh, I do know that the ICB in its former disguise as CCB, they were very much promoting the accessible uh, information standards because actually the providers have to comply with it. So there, is, there isn't a room of I will may do it, it, I have to do it. So I think it is something as uh, an ICB, we may just want to at some point look at it and see what the compliance is and so on and uh, what improvements needs to take place. So uh, thank you for, for reminding us of those standards. Um, thank you, Judith. I don't see any other hands up in relation to what you reported. So I'll move on to uh, Andy, if it's OK. Andy, um, <laughs> I still can't see you, but I know you are there. Over to you, please. Thank you, Elian. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Andy Yacoub, uh, Chief Exec of Healthwatch Suffolk. Um, as Eliana was saying, that I will take it as read. Um, we shared some uh, a short update about what we're doing, and like uh, Judith, what we're what we've finished, and also what we're planning to do to an extent. So, should you want to ask me anything about maternal mental, maternal mental health? Uh, dental care, dementia, which we'll be publishing is quite an in-depth piece of work in, in May. 
schools work around mental health and well-being, which is in year seven currently, but I can talk about the last year's report uh, and what we're doing this year. Um, work around children's uh, lives uh, with asthma. Um, health coaching, which we'll be reporting on soon as well. Uh, your Care Your Way, again, Judith was talking about that. It's associated with Health Watch England's work around accessibility, uh, which and we've gone on to do some more work around uh, DDEF and hard of hearing. And in fact, we've uh, we've improved our feedback uh, option offer to the public um, because we've got uh, a contract with Sign Live now and people who use British Sign Language can uh, leave feedback with us using that uh, chosen way of communicating. Uh, we started doing some work, brief work around dermatology, uh, and then we're going to start a major piece of work for the next 18 months uh, from April with um, people who receive care at home. Um, there is uh, also some updates in the summary that I've shared about what we do in Waveney specifically. So the projects I was referring to just now cover the whole of Suffolk. Um, but we do have a community uh, team that uh, and get involved in uh, everything that's going on really uh, around the Waveney area itself, including all 13 GP practices. Um, and we also have a co-production team and a couple of projects that they're working on currently, one around tackling poverty um, and also one around active travel, should anyone want to be involved in that or know a little bit more about that. One other thing I was just going to say, uh, thinking back on what Tracy was uh, talking about earlier, um, a very a very previous job of mine in the past was around diversity and equality, so I specialised in. Um, that presentation could quite easily be copied and pasted back to 10, 20 years ago. It's really about what we achieve uh, and how we set our minds differently because um, one, I would add another key challenge really to your list, Tracy, uh, in that I don't know the results for Norfolk, but I know nationally and in Suffolk, public health reported that uh, health inequalities widened last year. So despite all the efforts and despite all the data and knowing what, what the challenges are, the biggest challenge is that we're not actually reversing that trend still. So it really does need quite a concerted effort. Um, and I'll leave you with one thought. Um, many of you, I hope, will, if not all of you, understand that there is a, a social model of disability as well as a medical model where you're not looking at the individual or the illness or the disability. You're looking at the environment in which the person lives in, works in. And I think we could pot potentially look at removing barriers if we look at equality and equity as a social model of equity. So we don't necessarily think about the individuals or the communities, but we think about the environment within which they're, they're trying to reach and improve their lives. But thank you earlier, Tracy. It was a very good presentation. Thank you, thank you, Andy. Any questions for Andy from anybody? Um, my question will be to both to Andy, to you and to, to Judith when I was reading through. Um, what would be good for us to be just going forwards? Um, because, you know, lo lots of work is going on. Um, and I know that you provided links to all the reports, but I'm just wondering from the uh, sort of efficiency of this committee, if when we report back uh, to this committee on all the work you have, if you can just do bullet points on what are the key findings, because the, the chances of us going to every report and reading, uh, uh, you know, if we are honest with ourselves, will be pretty slim, I guess. We may do some, but not all of them. So, uh, again, to be able to um, bring to this committee's attention the work which we really need to start focusing and prioritizing, it will be good just to have a bullet point on the findings uh, and uh, what, from your perspective, the priorities should be, if that makes sense. If not, we can talk outside this uh, this meeting about it. But it's just to make sure that everyone on the committee actually has that general understanding and uh, see how we can take items forward or issues forward. Does that make sense, Judith? 
Yeah, yeah, very happy with yeah. that. And actually, it makes much more sense to present perhaps the bullet points of some of the pr project recommendations, because right. because they will sometimes be recommendations either for County Council or for the ICB. So it makes sense to see if they've been heard. And That's right. Well, upon. exactly. And it's exactly that, because I do know that you're trying your best to bring to the system's attention. But if we can channel it through this committee, too, then that hopefully will be uh, sort of a bit more constructive also. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, anybody with any questions? Now, I think we'll thank house, both House Watchers for all the work they are doing. Uh, they they are representing the voice of our local population. We need to listen, take into account uh, the findings and the recommendations uh, to make sure that it influences what we are doing. So thank you, Beth, and thank you to your teams for all the work you're doing. Uh, and we'll look forward to the next update and see what comes from those. Thank you. Uh, OK, moving on to um, the item on mental health transformation. Um, you might uh, remember that we have agreed that at each committee meeting we'll focus on one of the seven corporate uh, priorities. Um, and we'll do a bit more of a deep dive into those issues. So we have decided to go with mental health transformation topic today. Um, I'm really pleased that today we are joined by a number of people who are taking part in that work. And whilst Mark Payne is going to introduce the, the topic, we are going to have a number of people who will bring um, the, the sort of the insight into their involvement with people with lived experiences and so on, practical uh, examples, so we can uh, get a better understanding. So, um, mm -hmm. Mark, I think you're there somewhere. Again, I can't see you, but I'll pass it over to you so you can uh, introduce the, um, the topic and introduce people who have very kindly joined us today to share with us their experiences uh, and, uh, and um, yeah, for us to learn from that and see how we can apply that in other areas of our work. So, Mark, over to you. Thanks, Aliona. Um, so, for the people that don't know me, I'm Mark Payne. I'm the Deputy Head of Mental Health um, Adult Commissioning. And joining me today will be Samantha Holmes from Rethink, Morgano, who's one of our experts by experience, and Adrian Grant, again, one of our experts by experience. So as they go through, they'll take over the presentation. So you've only got a few words from myself, um, and then I'll be handing it over to those guys. So the NHS long-term plan set out a bold vision for transformation and community mental health care for adults. We're two years into that transformation journey through working in partnership with local voluntary organisations, our local authorities and experts by experiences. We are providing more options for people to get the right help in the right way for them, but we still have a long way to go. The experts by experiences you'll hear from shortly who are supported by Rethink are integral to our plan and decision making. I'll hand you over to Sam from Rethink to explain how co-production is at the heart of our transformation journey. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Um, is it OK if I share my screen to share um, the model that we, we've been working to? Is Would that be all right? And I'll sort of introduce myself in the meantime, I can see some nods. OK, so, so bear with me while I do that. Um, so I'm Sam Holmes. I work for Rethink Mental Illness and we facilitate um, co-production, uh, involvement and co-production on the um, uh, adult mental health transformation programme that Mark just introduced. Um, and I thought it would be helpful to to share the model on my on my screen um, and just just very, very just for a minute. Um, uh, say something about it and uh, I think it should be loading. Here it is. OK, brilliant. Um, so um, on, there's nothing on our screen, so I don't oh. know if anybody else has this. <laughs> ah, I can see it on mine. Um, that's interesting. Um, maybe I'll just uh, I'll just talk then. It, it don't understand why it's on mine and not on yours. Apologies. Um, I'll just talk it through. So um, the model is is to bring flow lived experience information um, or data even from a, a, a wide range of people in the community through community conversations, um, particularly with people who are currently underserved and experiencing highest health inequalities. 
So through those conversations, information comes in um, and it, it and the um, experts by expert by experience leaders uh, who are in, in a reference group, they come together in a reference group, they're in strategic um, co-production roles um, and they consider what's coming in alongside, you know, their, their, their own priorities, their own collective lived experience priorities. So these are kind of building um, and recommendations can come out of that. Um, and all of that sort of turns into insight that can that can go into shared considerations um, about um, what what to do um, with various system stakeholders, so various people on the program, um, practitioners and change managers mm -hmm. and commissioners. Um, and so it's very much about working in partnership um, and then lived experience representation onwards into um, projects and steering groups and onto the board. Um, and then uh, information flows back um, about uh, how lived experience has influenced um, change and um, continuous improvement um, and also you know what is changing for the better um, particularly where people are um, so, so 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 what's what's different and um, often that goes back through trusted messengers in the community and that that's that's how we um, have the conversations uh, in in the first place so that's uh, I'm sorry I couldn't share my screen um, but that is um, the, the the model that we're that we're working towards yeah mark says he, he's he's won't let him share either okay so it's not just me that's good to know um so Samantha, uh, yes would it be okay we can circulate it after the meeting maybe with the minutes so then we can see yeah. it thank you I'll, mm -hmm. I'll send it over I'll, I'll yeah i'll send it over thank you um so uh um can i hand over to morgana please who is one of our expert by experience leaders morgana over to you Thank you very much. Um, I'm just making sure because I'm holding myself very carefully. Can't hear you, Morgana. Can is it? Can you oh, turn the volume up or? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me now? It, yeah, I think so. Okay, that's all right. I was just saying that I was just holding myself very carefully because I'm aware that my headphones keep cutting out. So I wanted to make sure my mic was okay. So mm -hmm. if that's okay. Um, well, hello everybody. Um, nice to meet everybody who I haven't met. Uh, my name is Morgana. I am one of the experts by experience. Um, with the Norfolk and Waveney reference group, um, keeping an eye to the time. And um, I am mainly working um, in the eating disorders work stream. Um, and one of the major things that's happened there um, in terms of recent things is obviously the fact that there's um, a lot more joining up happening between um, different trusts. Uh, the fact that I referenced the Norfolk and Waveney reference group is because there are other reference groups in other counties and it's obviously fantastic when we get together um, in a number of the work stream meetings I'm doing to see what people in other counties are doing. So it's obviously very much more a kind of national effort to coordinate um, service provision and seeing who's doing what where and what people are working on that sort of thing. Um, and so that's obviously been the kind of major thing recently, mm -hmm. have been a lot more to do with service provision around um, eating disorders that are less well known, uh, such as ARFID, which is Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. So it's obviously very much up and coming in terms of um, what service provision is being made and that sort of thing. Um, and in terms of how I actually got into this work myself, um, I have a background in advocacy, social justice, that sort of thing. Um, and what I find, what, what I found that very much inspired me with this is that <clears throat> there is often a lot of discussion that's obviously very involved and there's very much people kind of wanting to make a change and that sort of thing. But unfortunately, people can have a mistrust sometimes, I think, of the system. And there's also, on, on an individual level, people often feel that they don't want to tell their stories because they they kind of feel like that's that's putting in too much effort and they, they, there can be a lot of back and forth unfortunately sometimes and I looked at that and I thought but the thing is I feel there is something really valuable in actually <laughs> bridging things and showing the system showing you know kind of people in the system how stuff works and what people are experiencing on the ground um, and that's obviously a major reason I joined up with this, but I obviously wanted to have an opportunity to tell my story and have an opportunity to 
help to influence change in a way that when you're then hearing about people going, oh, we're really struggling with this, you can go, well, actually, when we look look over policy and changes and things, they do take time, but they do happen. And it can be reassuring people who are worried that those changes might not happen. Um, and I think it would be fair to say that in what I've encountered so far, that that has been true. You know, it, it is clear within the last year, especially, that when we're going from We've, you know, someone's coming along with some policy change they want to make happen. And then a few months to a year down the line, they come back and they go, you remember that we were doing X? Well, we've now moved on to the next stage of, and you can see it happening, which is great. Um, and so I think that's about bringing things to time. And so it's, it's obviously lovely to meet all of you. And we have, thank you, Morgana. That was, that was brilliant. Thank you. Um, and here's Adrian. Adrian is another expert by experience leader. Thank, thank you, and, and thank you everyone for uh, inviting me here today. Um, my name's Adrian. Um, I'm here as an expert by experience. Um, I'm autistic and I've had mental ill health, including crisis uh, since childhood and throughout my adult life. Uh, I'm not unusual in this regard, as I think it's estimated that about 80% of autistic people also have mental ill health and a range of other co-occurring conditions and difficulties. Um, so I've used throughout my life and continue to use mental health services and I, like many other people, regularly slip between services and are shunted from one service silo to another, constantly repeating my con condition to new and different people. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to be involved, and I think it's actually why many experts by experience want to be involved, which is to try and shape mental health services to become much more holistic and integrated. And clearly integration is now a central tenant, tenant a new policy. So in many ways, we're all in agreement about the direction of travel that we want to go in. So I've been involved for just over a year now, and I can honestly say that I've been impressed by the the, the motives and motivation of everyone to try and make changes for the better for the right reasons as well and for the with the right information and importantly with the right people involved and i think a fundamental way um, of doing that is by listening to the voices of people who use these services and not just about asking them about their opinion about a the service they've just had experience of but actually allowing them and welcoming them uh, to be part of the planning, the design, the review, right from the very beginning, throughout and continually into the future. So I guess I guess what I'm describing there is co-production. And it's not an easy thing to, to accomplish for huge statutory organisations. It, it definitely requires a shift in thinking, it requires a diff perhaps speaking differently, and perhaps most difficult, it definitely requires kind of changing organisational culture. But, but I have to say over the last year, I've seen firsthand uh, the commitment of people within these organisations to do exactly that. And it's not perfect. It probably never will be, um, but it is heading in, in the right direction. In the last year, progress has definitely, definitely been made. So I thought it might just be useful to, just to give you a few examples of how co-production is working from my experience. And, and this is all in relation to the Mental Health Community Transformation CT programme. So as a volunteer expert by experience, I currently chair the Mental Health CT Reference Group. I co-chair the Mental Health CT Steering Group, and I have a seat on the Mental Health Partnership Board itself. And all experts by experience are able to join all of these groups, not just me. And the fact that experts by experience are actually a part of these groups, I think in itself is, is progress and a lot of progress in, 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 in basically a few months. And I don't do that with just my single voice either. I, I'm actually there and I represent a very wide collective of experts by experience, both their voices and their and their wider networks. So I think this is fantastic progress in achieving co-production in Norfolk for mental health services, which brings to the table really an extremely comprehensive and rich, and it really is rich volume of opinion and experience from people that actually use the services and whose well-being depends on it. So to this end, a number of co-production initi initiatives have 
been achieved that I just wanted to comment on. Some some will by necessity need to be constantly in revision to ensure that we've got the right information, the right voices for services as they currently are. And I've just picked out a few. I've picked out four, four things. Uh, number one, as a group of experts by experience, we've developed a set of I statements. And these can be used in kind of multiple settings to aid planning, service development and, and review. Number two, we've developed and this is ongoing and live a set of current priorities that work alongside those I statements to, to achieve exactly the same ends. Number three, we're working on developing a co-production strategy and framework that will inform how to do co-production well. And that's that's with a number of partners across the system. That's not just experts by experience, although they are part of that work. Number four, we're in, we've just been involved in the latest ICB, let's talk mental health surveys to seek a dialogue with a much wider population. And it's worth noting, and I just wanted to stress it, that, that our experts by experience are all volunteers and not employees of any organisation in this in this regard. They, just, just like me, are here because they're passionate about this subject. And I'm afraid I don't have time to talk about any of these initiatives um, in any real detail, but I just want to assure everyone that these are fantastic pieces of work, are incredibly rich in detail, and they come directly and I mean directly from real people and real experiences. And um, I think and finally I'd just like to say that we probably should congratulate ourselves for our achievements in making co-production in mental health services start to work in Norfolk and I, and I genuinely believe it will get even better as we go forward. Um, so I think that's it from me so um, thank you for listening. Thank you, Adrian, uh, and thank you, Morgana and Samantha. Do you want to add anything, Samantha, before I open for questions? Nothing to add. Um, happy um, between us to um, take questions. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, yeah, thank you so much for making the time to be here today. And it's very pleasing to hear that we began the journey journey of engaging with people's lived experience and listening to what they have to say uh, and uh, contributing to actually improving what we are doing. Um, question for Morgana, one of the things you said uh, was about the mistrust of the system very much resonated with me with feedback I get from patients too. If you are to pick up on one thing that people working within the system must do to start changing that, what do you think that would be Morgana? That's a really good question, and I, I'm hoping you can hear me better now. I, I have turned my, my, my microphone volume up. Um, it's difficult one to say. I think, I think probably what I would say from my own experiences of therapy, dealing with doctors, that sort of thing, is there does need to be um, a willingness for people to listen to lived experience more. Um, I think that a lot of the time, doctors and sometimes therapists have tendency to go away and go, oh, well, I read lots of papers, I read lots of diagnostic material. And that's fine. I understand that the whole point of a label is that you can go, right, we've given this person a label because they meet the diagnostic criteria and that gives you a treatment plan. I, I completely understand that. But I think that sometimes, especially if it's, if it's about a person's experience, you need to be able to hear what they're saying and go, okay, this thing would still fit within what we're saying. It's just a bit unusual. So maybe we need to broaden our criteria. Um, and so for me, that's actually a major part of why I think this work is so important because I actually think that, especially when it comes to eating disorder work as well, um, I see far too little when it comes to conferences of people saying, Look, actually have a section so people with the lived experience of an eating disorder can tell can talk about their experiences. It's a lot more um, clinicians presenting papers. And in a sense, that kind of ends up, if there are any biases there, it's going to end up reinforcing those biases. Whereas if you actually listen to someone saying, well, this has been my direct experience, and you can start collating, a bunch of other people are also saying, well, yes, I agree with that experience because that's been mine too it can start to actually shape what the the kind of relevancy and the sort of authenticity and validity of how things are being diagnosed, if that makes sense, because you are actually hearing from people with the actual experiences themselves. Um, it, it's, it, it's one of the tricky areas, I think, where like, you can go to a doctor, you can get a diagnosis, 
there's there are diagnostic criteria but sometimes those those experiences are as much about i have presented my experience i need you to understand what the internal mm. experience is rather than meeting a checklist necessarily so you know I'm, I'm, aware, I'm aware it's a complex process, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. You're Thank you for welcome. your insight. I will go quickly to uh, Tracy and then Mark. We are just about on spot on time, so if we can yeah, keep it short, I'll please. I'll be very quick. So, so Adrian and Morgana, thank you very much for your insights and the work you're doing. It sounds fantastic. So, um, as a as a clinician, I work particularly with inclusion health groups, so predominantly with people that experience homelessness. So, I think some of the communities I I work with are very kind of have the most quieter voices and and would find that kind of approach to co-production and being involved quite challenging. So, just wondering, you know, from your experience, sort of top tips and how we can support perhaps some of our more quieter voices to be involved. I know there's some good models such as um, Pathways and Groundswell and various things, but I'm just thinking kind of locally, you know, some from your experience and perhaps some, some top tips and some help in how, how we could do that for people that do find it quite a challenge to, you know, to be involved really. Want me to comment? Can I jump in? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, well, maybe I can uh, not add a, a particular view in. I kind of frequently represent the autistic community and I'm autistic myself, so I know the difficulties of, of, of engaging in kind of in kind of wider social kind of meetings and, uh, and, and that sphere. How we've overcome that a little, not perfectly, but, but in, again in the right direction is to wherever, wherever it's possible to do things uh, uh, remotely. And, and virtually, that that definitely helps. And I think it's about creating an atmosphere where, and this takes a bit of work and effort, that, that the person or people that you're engaged with feel that they can come and go as they want to. So they've got that freedom to just literally leave at any moment without any criticism and without any judgment. And it's the small things that you do around that engagement that makes that engagement easier. Um, and it's step by step, little by little. And the more the people do that, the more kind of safe they feel in that environment and will engage a little bit better next time. And it's and it's a kind of a learning journey and for everyone, include, including the people that you're engaging with. Thank I you. think that helps, but yeah. Thank you. Um, can I go to Mark now, please? Mark, very quickly. Thanks, Mm-hmm. I'll be really quick because I know. Firstly, I want to repeat your thanks, uh, Morgana, Adrian, uh, and Sam. And Adrian, it's good to see you again. It's a long time yeah. since we've caught up. But it's really good to see. You. Um, and just my question was broadly similar to Aliona's and, and Tracy's about. Uh, but so, but I'm going to put up, make it a comment this time. Please do keep challenging us as an ICB around doing things the right way. We really welcome that. But mm-hmm. what I was really encouraged to hear is Morgana. You mentioned um, you see change happening. I think that that's really good to hear. How do we keep doing that? Uh, Adrian, you, you highlighted kind of motivation to see change happening. Let's how do we build and grow that uh, listening to the voices uh, and you know that we're heading in the right direction. But do we how do we get even better at it? So I'm not going to ask you to answer all those questions now, but please do keep feeding that back uh, in the weeks and months ahead. So thank you and really appreciate you coming and telling your stories as well. It, uh, it, it is really good to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And yes, I will uh, I'll support very much that. Please, please uh, talk to us, um, sort of help us understand better and uh, and help us think it through with you. Uh, and I will encourage Samantha and Mark uh, continue the good work and please, please build up on it uh, so we can get to the next stage and even better. Uh, and I'm sure we'll learn from here into and take it forward in other areas of the, the work. So Thank you again to everybody, and uh, we'll look forward to hear from you at some point later in the year. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I will. Uh, I will move on. Uh, Rebecca, you'll have to try and help us uh, win some time here, but we are going to move on to the people and communities approach update. Uh, I'm very pleased to see that actually we are progressing with uh, with this uh, work quite well. We are mobilising the system, um, uh, uh, and. Uh, the, the system why people and communities approach at, at the pace. Uh, I'm sure Rebecca will tell us uh, an update in a minute to will give us an update where we are. Uh, what I would like to do is to actually acknowledge the work which has been done 
within the Community Voices Project. Um, I, I now as a pilot, uh, however, there was quite a good work uh, which took place uh, within that project and uh, and we have some plans for the future, which I'm sure we'll hear at a later stage, but Rebecca can give us some headlights as to what has been achieved. So Rebecca, over to you, please. Uh, just in the in the interests of of brevity, uh, I'll, I'll I'll try and do it all in five minutes. And I'm aware that there's colleagues in in the room, virtual room. So please do do wade in as well. If if I just uh, say that you know I I did put as much detail as I could into the presentation. So please do go and have a look. And my email address is in there if you want any more. So if I just ask Rachel maybe to just show the community voices slide. There is a slide in the presentation uh, updating on community voices. But um, uh, last last time when we had the the full presentation, um, it was pointed out that there was it was a bit light on outcomes. Um, so we've um, pulled together a, a slide uh, with with the latest up to date data. It's also um, a kind of draft. It's a kind of a draft format. Um, so. Um, Working with Yarmouth and Waveney Voices, our, our data person has pulled this together, and it, it did also include some uh, inf some heat maps and things about some quite detailed information about all the demographic stuff. But I didn't include that just in in um, the uh, interests of, of brevity. But I'm sure we can share that so that you can see a little bit more more information. Um, so uh, th this is, I, I looked this morning and we have 684 recorded conversations um, over approximately <clears throat> eight months. And and I just totted up these numbers on, on this, and there's 132. Frankie, did you have something about the I'll present? finish and then I'll come in at the end. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, there was 132 recorded outcomes, um, but but also just to to say, actually, there will have been other much harder to quantify outcomes and consequences of the of the conversations on on the doorsteps. Um, but these are uh, quite clearly defined outcomes that the connectors and and stuff have have recorded. This is the first time you'll have seen this data. I'm sorry, it wasn't available in time to share a week in advance. It is really hot off the press, but I thought it was interesting that the top two at 24 each were sort of um, being directed to to community groups and accessing benefit support. Probably not that surprising in 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 the current climate. But actually, the coming in at second is is assistance with getting GP appointments um, and um, people helping people to uh, be registered with their GP and then behind that is is support with housing but actually you know thinking about this that that one person who who didn't go to um court for their council tax is also a huge achievement um so really helping someone not go down that road uh, and all the all the uh, associated things that, that that would go go with that um you know Community voice is about the voice of community, it's about the voice of, of people kind of working very closely with, with district councils and, and voluntary sector to, to um, recruit them. But it is very much about qualitative data. Mm. And, and I don't want to go down the kind of numbers. I don't want to take lots of great qualitative stuff and turn it too much into numbers so that we start losing some of the, the, the other things. If the numbers are too small, it doesn't matter necessarily if the numbers are small. So I, um, I think it's, it, it's sort of not losing sight of that. And also just being really clear that Community Voices is still a pilot. We are learning as we go along. Um, we, we're very keen to learn. Um, and I think, you know, this this is this is about outcomes that pretty much happened there and then on the doorstep there and then. But there is also stuff that we can learn from the data as we go along and as we get better at this, that that's about the system wide. Um, the um, some of that more strategic, uh, what strategic outcomes, how can we use that? Um, across the system. Um, and I think, as we said before, the ultimate vision is that we would be training people all over the system to to in input feedback that they hear um, in their frontline roles, people that work with with people day to day, so that we will be gathering a lot of that really, really rich qualitative qualitative information. Um, yeah, so uh, in the presentation, I mentioned the UEA training. We've just had the first the the the, the first phase of community of community voices has had some really robust evaluation from UEA. So there's loads of learning to do there, and I think we can um, come back at, uh, maybe at 
the possibly at the May meeting to to give you some more. We just it's two hundred and seven pages. There's lots of digesting to do. So I think um, at, at the next one we can we can perhaps give you a much fuller update. Um, and and just in the one minute, I don't want to put them on the spot, but I know I know you're in the audience, Shelley, and I just wondered whether you wanted to add anything that I haven't um, covered. <laughs> or perhaps you've gone. Thanks, Rebecca. No, I was just trying to hide in the back. <laughs> Thank you. Never. <laughs> um, yeah, so our colleagues at Great Yarmouth Borough Council have been supporting us with the analysis of the information. As Rebecca has mentioned, there is a huge amount of information that's coming into this. Um, and this is just a snapshot of what's happening as a there and then. Um, but the systems impact of this work, I think, is potentially um, really strong. So uh, as an example, some of the learning um, that we've taken from voices we've used to work with our public health colleagues to think about the rollout of a making every check contact count uh, training program and that has come through direct feedback from the community voices program uh, and we've been able to inform what that looks like based on uh, the recommendations through those trusted communicators so a significant link for us i think with the voluntary sector uh, thinking about how we work more closely with them and, and build on that trust that they have with the communities that perhaps we don't so there's a huge opportunity for us to do more We've managed expectations so far because it is just a pilot, so not everyone will know about voices yet. Um, we do hope to change that and we've got a full time programme lead uh, joining us in a month or so's time uh, who will help us to really drive this programme forward, which is quite exciting because we can take all the learning we've had from the pilot and think about how we build this into business as usual, which, you know, this is a way of working. So I guess our appetite here, you know, the ambition here is to build this into BAU um, and for this kind of type of working with the voluntary sector, with local government, etc., to, to be the norm. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I'll go to Frank and then if I may, I have one or two um, questions or, or, or observations. Frankie. Thanks. Th thank you so much. I'm so delighted to see this. I'm delighted to see it for, for two reasons. Firstly, for the individuals who are contacting. So if you can prevent a court summons, you know, how incredibly powerful, but also and slightly more selfishly, because this helps us do our job better. And I'm really, really keen that I was really struck by um, uh, Judith's comments when she was talking about the Health Watch Norfolk report saying it, you know, it's pharmacy, dental and GP access. And then the, Suff the Suffolk Health Watch support, um, report there's an analysis of the signposting contacts and I really think we should put these together to say actually this is where people need signposting and so for next time I'd like to see the, the, a bit of a you said we did so you know we kept hearing that it was a problem getting hold of this so what we've done is simplify it and we've got a campaign to publicize how to simplify access that so anything we've done but also anything we can do in future well how you know where's the so what what are we doing with this how are we you know I'm slightly obsessed with simplifying access because people it's complicated. People don't know. So we've really got to make sure that we use all this incredibly rich data from Community Voices, but also from Healthwatch and the you know, Assistant Advice Bureau and anywhere else that people are coming saying they don't understand how to get help so that we can make it easier for people to get help as early as possible because people don't, you know, often people don't know what it is they need. They just know they need some help. So if we can make it as simple and easy to do things to get that help early we're on a winner aren't we because if we can intervene earlier we can, it's better and cheaper and quicker and you don't have to do it twice yeah thank you frankie uh you, you sort of stole on half what i was going to say <laughs> the, the good thing about about the project is that uh, actually if we have the right people delivering people with the right knowledge delivering then we can uh, enable people to access whatever the challenge they may have much earlier as you're saying so i think is is having the, the right uh sort of concept of delivery concept to the right people is quite important in all of this businesses uh, as usual is good. I will be concerned about a few things, but probably that's why I'll welcome a conversation with Shirley about how this project is taken forward, um, just to make sure that we don't universalize it to the point where we actually do not reach those people we want to reach because it's not delivered by the right uh, people, uh, the right organizations and so on. Um, but uh, in terms of you said you did is exactly that. We do need to demonstrate to people that we've listened and it's going back to what we just heard from our two experts at lived experience. You said you've made this change. We need to start demonstrating that. And I now is a pilot, but I now at the same time that you do have examples of that. So I think we just need to start sharing them uh, so people can 
trust us better and is back to that trust, it, we're asking the question, we need to have some answers to it. Yeah, so uh, it's very good work in progress. I think Community Voices is a very good project uh, for us to, to be focusing on and develop further. We just need to make sure that the formula for delivery is the right formula for delivery. So, Shirley, I would leave it for you to work. It would be good to have a chat at some point about it. And of course, we'll look forward to having further updates and hear about this good work which is happening. Um, it will be great at, at further meetings. Yeah. Thank you. I can't see any other hands up from anybody. OK, so uh, Rebecca, thank you. Shirley, thank you. And please thank the teams in the background who are delivering uh, and doing the hard work, because I do know that we're actually helping quite a good number of people with their issues. Uh, we just need to highlight that and the achievements. We're very good at criticizing, but there's good good outcomes, so we need to identify them. Thank you. Uh, OK, the last item on the agenda and the, any other business. Um, as a committee, we do have to uh, report to the ICB board on the achievement of our objectives. So yes, there is a, a reporting uh, process in place. However, as we mentioned at the beginning, when now I can't remember, was that you, Frankie, who said at the beginning that we need to think of when we're going to do what and how we bring items to the, yes, that all links to this. So what I'm going to suggest is that we have uh, a committee meeting, which is uh, just the committee members, so we can get our ducks in a, in, a, in, a, in a order, in a row. Is that the right word in English? You know I think exactly what I mean, but we need to organize ourselves better, I think. Uh, we are new, so you know, two meetings, that is good, but I think now we have to have a plan in place so we know exactly what we're doing. So I will ask Rachel uh, to circulate some dates so we can have a, a meeting of the committee only and uh, get that underway, if that's okay with the committee members. Any notes? Hmm? Yes, no? Okay, lovely. Uh, thank you. We, we will do that. So this leaves me to say a big, big thank you to everyone who joined us today, to all the presenters, to people who asked questions, to the committee members um, and anybody else who I may have forgotten. Forgive me, I can't see everyone on the screen, but thank you very much. We we'll look forward to having you at the next meeting, which will be in May. But in the meantime, please, if you have questions or you have ideas, suggestions and so on, please, please communicate them to us. And uh, Paul, um, we discussed that. Hopefully you can put the email address uh, which people can contact uh, contact the team at so we can have those questions and suggestions so on to, to consider them before the next meeting. Uh, thank you again to everybody. Stay safe and looking forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Aliana. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.